hello Maggie how are you first off I'm good I'm good how are you doing I'm, I'm very well thank you very much um so well I suppose we'll get we'll get it kick kick started with uh, what you've what you're working on at the moment or what's being released that you've worked on uh is the staircase uh, that's the the big show that uh, you have written and you're a producer on um right. So I wanted to know how did this uh, whole thing come in? Like, how did it come about? How did you end up working on it? Um, I've always been a fan of the documentary. Uh, I saw it in you know the early two thousands um, when it came out on the Sundance Channel, and I just you know as a filmmaker, I the construction of story and narrative is always really compelling. And I think the staircase documentary is a really interesting exploration of a family and not only a family, but a family in crisis. And then also about the judicial process. Um, I got sent a pilot script um, and I, that Antonio Campos had uh, written yeah. and we had spoken earlier, Antonio and my, I, about collaborating on other movies. Um, and he, you know, it finally, you know, the, the stars aligned and I was available. And so I came on basically as somebody with um, television writing experience and um, experience taking stories and, um, you know, creating a holistic vision for an eight episode arc. And so... Mm. I came in and um, was the showrunner with him, and we developed the the season together um, with other writers, and so that was my um, primary introduction to it. And then, of course, as the showrunner, you go on and produce the entire series, and are there throughout every step of the way. I mean, it's on this. This story is something. Um, I'll, I'll let you know. I I, I grew up in France. Um, so the the original right. documentary was uh, you you know this of course uh, yeah. was made made by Canal Plus, and um, we knew growing up we knew this story quite well. Um, in, yeah. in France, it was it was quite well publicized. Was was that something? to to you when you were coming on board this project were you a bit worried about that in certain respects because it is such a well-known story um but there is also when you watch the show it is a bit of well did 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 michael do it or didn't he is you know there's that there's that bit of the uh, of the kind of mystery to it as well um i think if it were a straight adaptation it would be a concern um, but really what we're doing is we're introducing the documentary team and we're showing the the scenes and the moments that aren't included in the documentary, yeah. like the documentary filmmakers discussing which case to take and understanding that the Peterson case wasn't initially something they were totally intrigued by. Um, and so we really wanted to use the documentary team <clears throat> as a way to explore the concept of storytelling. So they're very much a visual cue and element um, within our story. Whereas if you watch the documentary, the style that they in which they filmed it and created and edited it um, is one where the, 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 the director and the filmmaker's hand is hidden, although yeah. very obviously present. So it, I think since they were characters in our show, it actually seemed like a ver very new terrain to explore um, because that's not something we witnessed before. The other yeah. thing to keep in mind is that the key element missing from the documentary is understanding who Kathleen Peterson was as a poor in person. And so that was very important to me to bring to, you know, to bring forward a more realized um, character, um, mm. a woman who was a businesswoman, um, she was a mother, she was a wife, she was um, the life of the party. And that those elements while spoken about in the documentary are absent in a visual way. And so we were able to, you know, with the help of Tony Collette, of course, um, you know, introduce a character that hadn't ever been seen before. Yeah, and and that really comes through. Um, in the, I mean, we've only had the first three episodes so far, but even in the first three episodes, um, first of like casting Tony Collette, that was a, a masterstroke. 
because uh, she's she's amazing. Uh, I've been a massive fan of Tony Collette for years. Um, uh, watching this, uh, and I, I literally just watched Hereditary a couple of days oh. before. <laughs> an um, <interesting> film. <laughs> it's an interesting double bill. Yeah. Um, and, and like honestly, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about casting as well because this show has a ridiculously talented cast. Um, you, of course, you've got Tony Collette, you, you've got Colin Firth, you've got Dane DeHaan in there as well. You've got Patrick Schwarzenegger, Sophie. T the list is endless. Um, yeah. How was how was that getting these uh, these uh, actors on board? What was the casting process like? And was was like Colin Firth and Tony Collette were they your first choices for the role? If you're involved in casting at all? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm. You're involved. Uh, yeah, so very involved. Um, it, well, we had four scripts to go off of. Um, and so everyone received, um, I think the first three actually, and then maybe the fourth. So I think, uh, you know, I don't want to presume to speak for our actors, but I think when you receive that much material up front and you are intrigued by it, uh, you can trust that the rest of it's going to be as interesting, if not more. Um, mm. And so we got very lucky that the people that we thought could champion these characters um, responded in kind. And so <clears throat> the initial casting was really, it, you know, easy, as easy as casting can be. Um, and we got really, what you just don't know though is coming in is what is that alchemy going to be like yeah. when everybody arrives on set? I, I, we were, very confident that each of the actors could play the character, but what does it look like when all these characters get together, having never seen that before, um, mm. never seen that ensemble. And so you kind of cross your fingers about that. And, you know, in my opinion, we got the, the, the power of the combination of everybody working together is in and of itself probably one of the most impressive elements of this entire show. Um, and that also speaks to the smaller, you know, quote unquote, smaller roles um, where we had great local casting. Um, and so it is, um, you know, adding seasoning to whatever the story yeah. is. And it's, we, we just feel, you know, that if you encourage an environment where people feel safe to explore something kind of as tragic as this that um they'll do it and so you know I, we got we got really lucky that everybody was really positive and just wanting the best out of themselves and out of each other and honestly it really comes through when when you watch it it's like you can tell that um they're they're really getting into their characters and they're basic honestly i what watching uh, watching the staircase, the the documentary, and then going on to watching the show, which is the way I did it, um, mm -hmm. is is quite is quite um, impressive. How uh, Colin Firth really is <laughs> it's like uncanny um, that you, you watch the tune. He's got the kind of the, the way he speaks down properly, and um, and and then as you mentioned before, you get to know more uh, about about what was really going on behind the scenes, which is um, something that I think um, a lot of people will, it will really make people at like really become attached to this show. And um, one of, one of the questions I had was how did your experience, because you seem to have, you seem to like working on crime on crime stories. <laughs> how, how did your, how did your experience on American crime story help you with the staircase? Um, I think what it what it did was I mean they're very different shows um, yeah. and uh, equally challenging in their own right. Um, uh, what what I will say is um, a consistent thing through you know American Crime Story, which I worked on you know different manifestations of that mm. series, and then also in Narcos, is that um, you begin to learn to understand what the story that research is telling you, which is. You can often find that you have primary sources that are vetted, um, that are legitimate, they're fact-checked, um, and then published by yeah. reputable publishing houses or magazines, and um, they contradict each other. 
And so what I found is I really wanted the opportunity to explore that contradiction, which is the idea that people look at the same facts and come up with different stories to explain these facts. And that mm-hmm. happens in pub- in the New York Times compared to the Washington Post or uh, the New Yorker compared to the Atlantic. Like every story is going to be slightly different using yeah. the same bits of information. And so for me, that I wanted to bring that question into the staircase, which is the idea that we we're giving the viewer and our characters are also receiving the same bits of information, facts, mm-hmm. if you will. And they're coming up with different stories to explain that I wanted to show that in a TV show. And so that's what makes the staircase different for me compared to the other nonfiction writing that I've, or nonfiction events that I've written. Um, it's, it's it's that contradiction that liminal space yeah. between what is what is truth that is really fascinating and that was presented that was the opportunity that i saw with this show um was to explore mm. that um which i haven't been able to do on other shows before that, that's actually interesting that's very interesting because when um i think at the beginning the very first episode of the staircase you have a quote and um i'm forget <laughs> it's all about truth and i'm i am so sorry i'm forgetting which it's truth. What is that? Yes, it's, that's it's that's it. On. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> it's just the idea. We all are looking for truth, um, and everyone has a different version of it. Yeah. What is it truly? I mean, it's kind of you can make it as complicated or as simple of a question as you want. That, well, that that's true because a lot of I mean, you you mentioned this before with the, the staircase is is it is a dramatization of what happened but um even in dramatization you might end up finding <laughs> some kernel of truth that don't worry <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> are you okay so i am i'm i'm just <laughs> getting over covid so i'm like me too oh, <laughs> you're not coughing no, I, I just stopped. I stopped coughing a couple of days ago, but I had. I um... did too. I don't know what this is. Anyway, <laughs> okay, I'm good. That's that's perfectly <laughs> fine. <laughs> it puts me at ease. Are you okay? Good. Okay. Yeah. No, but uh, yeah, as I was saying, it's like um, with with uh, certain forms of dramatization, sometimes you find a new, like a new angle and a new truth. There isn't such a thing as a new truth, but you know, you you do you do get to something that probably the uh, documentary hadn't really touched on right. before and um we yeah there were there were moments um because we use different resources and not just yeah. the documentary it was pretty a very diverse selection um there were new facts that came up um a new it, it also again just spoke to the idea that the fact always existed that there was just a different perspective about how to look at it. And our, Mm. our challenge was whether or not we wanted to highlight a new way of looking at something or reinforce an old way of looking at something or perhaps do both simultaneously. Um, It really is. We wanted, I think, you know, very early on the decision was made to um, not underestimate the viewer um, yeah. and we really, we wanted to create, um, legitimacy with them by, you know, asking questions and then answering them almost immediately within the context of the narrative. But there are larger questions that play or that are asked at the beginning of the season that you have to trust that we're going to answer them by the end. And I think yeah. it does, it has to do with the using some, you know, things that are commonly known about the case, if you're familiar with it and be like, we, we want you to know that we know, but yeah. now we're going to subvert and start playing with things a little bit, not in necessarily, and not in a way that doesn't feel inauthentic, but in a way that shows, but what if you look at it this way instead of that yeah. way? Um, and so that was, that was one of the challenges of the show is making sure we maintain that legitimacy, but also kind of, you know, still had the, um, the flexibility to, you know, leave some things ambiguous, um, mm. until the end, of course. Uh, I mean, and what, one of the, one of the things I was, uh, I found very interesting was your use of flashbacks. 
um, mm. in, in the show. Was when you were writing it, was that was that a method that you found would really help you early on? Well, <clears throat> we kind of what I found very helpful in um, the past, whenever you do, or in the past, meaning in past experiences I've had yeah. writing, um, <laughs> is that it's always helpful to come up with rules about how things will work. Um, mm. Because when you're debating between what's right and what's wrong, it's always good to go back to like a fundamental rule. And one of our rules was we have these three concurrent timelines and that they, once they started, they always moved forward in the context of their own timeline. So mm. while we are cutting from the past to the present to the future or some combination of that, one of our other rules was if you were to remove the dates, that the energy, the theme, and the character arcs would read as though it were the same time period. Yeah. And so when you do it like that, it almost feels like less of a flashback as opposed to time kind of compounding on itself, um, which was oh. kind of one of our goals. So the first, if you if you actually the way the season plays out is that the past timeline is going to run and in, uh, in, in the last episode it brings us basically to the moment that the present timeline starts our series. So the okay. series actually is a bit of a circle as opposed yeah. to just fully linear. That's, that's a Christopher Nolan trick. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we steal, we like to steal from the back. <laughs> it's the, the use of time. It's, yeah. it's very clever. And, it, and, and when I started watching the series, I was thinking... Oh, I think this must be the the end of this, uh, like right. close to the end of the series to begin right. with. Yeah, and it it does exactly. it does come through. It does. You did yeah. a very good job with that. Okay, um, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, I'm I, yeah, like you've done a really really good job with this show. But um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about your career because people that watch what we do here on small screen, they're always interested in how people got into what they're doing now, especially in okay. in the entertainment industry. And looking at your um, your IMDb list, you you started off working on uh, as an, uh, like a additional crew, like PA um, yeah. for for lots of people. So how how could you talk a little bit about about your journey to becoming a showrunner on one of HBO's <laughs> biggest shows coming out? Yeah, I'd kill a lot of people. No, um, <laughs> I uh, I no I. I started, I graduated from college, got a liberal arts degree. I studied film and political science and I got to LA um, and yeah. I had no idea how to apply all the theory that I'd learned. And I directed and written short films throughout college. But, you know, I had no idea how one actually creates a, a film or a TV show with money. Um, and so it, I started, yeah, I started as an office PA um, and I think I was recommended by a friend who I met working for free on a small independent film. And she was like, oh, my friend's father and blah, blah, blah. And so then I became an office PA and then a set PA. And then I started assisting directors. Um, and so I, you know, I, I watched what they did. Um, mm. And over time, I realized while there is a little bit of this kismet mysticism to being good at something, it's also just about working hard and communicating to people what you see mm -hmm. in your head. Um, and so that's about the time that I started, just, I decided to write. So up until that point, I'd kind of become well-versed in most elements of production and um, post-production, but I hadn't really started anything or focused on the development component, the writing, like the inspiration. And so I started doing that. And then, um, you know, at some point I was like, I need health insurance. Um, so I gave myself a month in Austin. I rented an Airbnb, the cheapest Airbnb I could find for a month. And I went there and I finished, I mean, I'm, I'm going to give writing this like one last hurrah. And then I'm going to focus yeah. on maybe some other slightly more accessible element to the entertainment industry. And I finished a pilot script and then um, 
I finished the last draft of that. And then I wrote the first draft or I wrote the first act of a feature. And six months later, the pilot script had sold and um, the feature had also sold. And so okay. it was kind of one of those happened very fast but was years yeah. in the making sort of scenarios um and from there i just started writing in um in writers rooms and then it's i think uh yeah because of my experiences and other elements of production i kind of am able to have a more managerial approach to things um because i'm not i wasn't just always a writer and so yeah. i have kind of a more comprehensive view of how things play out and how to get something made which that that's um i think that's kind of pivotal for anyone that wants to become not you know a show a showrunner uh, right. further down the line is that you, you've you've got lots of different um experiences and you blend that all together and then you end up um being the, the boss on a on a show like the staircase right <laughs> <laughs> um well, what are you working on next what am I working on now? I have a lot. <laughs> it's a little too soon to say, um, but I am, there's a, I have a spec feature that I'm writing that is um, somewhat, it's set in the future, but it is very much inspired by movies of the past, like Amblin films, specifically The Goonies. Mm. Um, oh. so that's actually <laughs> what I'm working on next. <laughs> it's that's supposed to, hopefully is a little fun. Yeah. <laughs> That, that's not that's not Lou, is it? No, Lou. No. Lou actually, I think if it comes, I think it's gonna come out after in September sometime, maybe. Okay. No but it was made. It's been shot, and yeah, it's a film. Great. So yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that, that, uh, we're looking forward to to that and the and the project that you that you teased sounds very <laughs> interesting. <laughs> And uh, yeah, if you, um, everyone watching, if you haven't watched The Staircase yet, you should do. It's on HBO. The first three episodes are available now. Um, I believe the next episodes, are they coming out on the... Thursday maybe? night. Thursday night, so tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Um, well, congratulations on the show. Uh, so far, I've been loving it, and I'm pretty sure the, uh, the, the last few episodes, it's eight episodes in total, isn't yes. it? But, yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to the, uh, the the next few episodes. Can't wait to see how it all ends, even though I kind of know how it ends, but <laughs> I'm looking forward to, to watching it. Thank you okay. so much for talking to us, Maggie. Of course. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.